Welcome to Ideas and Images, the arts program by Mary Star Productions. I am your host for this program. My name is Virginia Walker, and I'm an assistant professor of English at Suffolk County Community College at the Eastern Campus at Riverhead on Long Island. Our guest for this program is the poet and fellow Shelter Islander, Dan Moran. Dan is the author of a book of poetry, Dancing for Victoria, which I've had the pleasure of reading and writing an introductory commentary for. Dan, welcome to Ideas and Images. Thank you for having me. Uh, Dan, we both live on Shelter Island, and I know that I have been affected by the place and even my own writing. And in what way do you think you have been affected by living on Shelter Island? Well, Shelter Island is an unusual place because uh, there are many creative people. There are painters and uh, writers as well. And I think just being in that kind of an atmosphere is, uh, um, lends itself to creativity. And uh, I know that many writers uh, will tell you that they enjoy being in the company of other writers, and it, it stimulates them, and I, I definitely find that about Shelter Island. And it's an unusual place to live in general, because yeah. it is an island. Yeah. One of your poems, I think, that you wrote about Shelter Island, Home Fires, won an award, or was featured in the Peconic Gallery last yes, year? Yes, this, this past year. Okay. Um, and I'd like to read it for you, if I I'd could. love to hear it. Home Fires. I'm looking forward to a place to call home, with a rack by the door to catch my sorry old hat again and again, and a familiar aroma to fill my nostrils. I'd like a big old chair to fit my tired self, like a favorite shoe, by a fire where I can sit and contemplate my fortunes and woes, hold my babes in lap and tell them all the tales I've collected in the days gone before, and watch snowflakes landing and melting like dreams on the big shade tree I had planted with just a spade and a palm. Mm. Uh, it's filled with nostalgia and images. It's beautiful. I know when I first read your book of poetry, you said to me that you felt you had been very influenced by Wordsworth, by Keats, by Yeats, by Kerouac. Uh, do you still feel those influences in your writing? Oh, yes. I, I like to read other poets, and I find uh, almost a certainty that they affect me in one way or another. I do like the Romantic Europe po poems especially. Um, but I enjoy all kinds of poetry, and I find that there's something to be had in, in almost everything that's written. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, if you'd like, I could read a poem. Yeah, I was going to ask uh, you for uh, after Keats sure. if you had it. Okay, sure. You also had one, I think, Reflections on Kerouac. And yes. <laughs> this, uh, this is the Keats one. Um, this was written uh, for a friend of mine whose name is George Lewis, who lives on Shelter Island. And uh, he had recommended to me that I read Keats' Ode to a Nightingale. And this was my uh, response to that. Prepare for me the feast divine, a table so resplendent, a place to sip on the timeless wine from the vineyards of contentment. I dread not nightfall's mystery from this vantage in the twilight, as did I then a youthful me, bathed in morning's dew light. Mine ear is cocked in deference to the far wind's beckoning to let my eternity commence my own faithless mortal reckoning. A nightingale at Gordon's gate, serenading sweet this fractured hour. Such strains to cause the soul elate, making the rumbling darkness cower. Oh, forever be this my final thought, mine eyes filled with this perfection. Is this raspy growl what time has brought me this furrowed face in this reflection? Age, you are cruel as the driver's whip, the sting of winter cross my back. As the fire of life falls from my grasp, my pastel-stroked sunrise fades to black. Great shadow, spare not sad insistence. Death knell, waste not your salty tears. My heart will cease without resistance when that day of darkness nears. With age, my gnarly fingers ache. Expression eludes me like a virgin. My face burns with each icy flake of the snows silent but urgent. Oh, mock me not, you wistful youth. Cast no fretful eye upon me. Take heed the truth senescence speaks before it speaks to thee. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you took all of the imagery from Keats and updated it and brought it to the 20th century. Do you have any other uh, contemporary poets that influence you or, or, or interest in contemporary craft in poetry? Uh, I enjoy the beat writers very beat much. Writers. Uh, Kerouac and mm -hmm. uh, Ginsberg and uh, Gregory Corso and uh, I did write uh, a poem about Kerouac, which oh, I'll see right. if I can 
find here. Was that the reflections that on Kerouac? Yes. That I, okay. Okay. Of course, Jack Kerouac was very much of a tragic figure. He uh, managed to drink himself to death at a fairly early age, and uh, I think that he probably exemplified a great deal of the uh, tragedy that many poets feel, and I think that that fuels, uh, to a great extent, the things that they write. Uh, this is called Reflections on Kerouac. Somehow you can't fight the sadness from poet-minded pen, a quick backstab on a sunny day, hearing myself screaming to deafness, puncturing myself to see me bleed. Too much ecstasy can depress, too much sound makes silence invaluable. A dance beat can tire feet, feeling each breeze like a naked man in a cold storm, reacting like a hammered knee, spitting out bittersweet confections from all of my glad sadness, my hand on the phone and weight of a ring, finding the places even light can't reach, hearing the roar of the ocean a thousand miles from the coast, staggering up mountainsides in the flatlands, suffering a parched throat in a tropical storm, feeling alone on a rush hour train, waiting for the next stop to see if it's home. Now, on the way here, you showed me a poem that you had written in the shape of a toothpick. Yes. Are you playing around with poetry lately, or the craft of uh, designing poetry uh, yeah. along certain lines? Yeah, I've been uh, very fortunate to uh, strike up a, a friendship with Alan Plans, mm -hmm. who's a, a local oh, yeah. South Fork oh, poet, poet and uh, very accomplished. And he's uh, taken to suggesting different uh, types of things for me to try, including mm -hmm. concrete poems, which are uh, poems that visually take on a certain form. Mm -hmm. And uh, the toothpick poem, which wouldn't have the same effect if I were to read it, unfortunately, is uh, shaped like a toothpick. We didn't do any uh, graphics for that. No. <laughs> but uh, trying different things, uh, you never know when you're going to hit on something that's going to open an avenue in your mind mm -hmm. uh, and, and allow you to do things that you hadn't considered before. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying everything that I possibly can. Oh, one of the uh, themes that runs throughout much of your poetry, especially in the book Dancing Victoria, is love. Love and all of its... Uh, of pain and glory, and I wonder if you would read us a love poem. Oh, sure. <laughs> of course, the book was uh, dedicated to my wife, Victoria, because she was very instrumental in me uh, taking poetry more seriously. I did it basically for my own amusement, and she enjoyed it so much that I started doing it... Uh, Your muse. ...a little more, yeah. yes, with a little more devotion. Uh, this is a relatively short one that's called The Saint's Foot. Um, I happen to know... Uh, great many older people on Shelter Island, and I find that uh, somehow people's eyes don't seem to change as they get older. They, even though the, their, fra their face may be different, uh, somehow the, their eyes still retain a certain amount of youth. And this is called The Saint's Foot. A day will come when I will gaze into these eyes of yours, and they will be deeper even than jade in the sea, framed in soft pine that living has both worn and polished, like a bronze statue of some saint whose foot gleams smooth from the touch of the adoring masses who must come to stroke it. Mm, that's lovely. Uh, what about politics? I don't think you're an ivory tower poet. I mean, you do uh, treat some political subjects, and I know you've done, I've heard you read at Canio's, and do you have anything political yeah, to read us today? Yeah, I'm generally... Over the political edge, maybe. Oh, sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm generally accused of having too many opinions, so... Uh -oh. I'm sure to... <laughs> Poets are not supposed to have opinions. <laughs> this was written uh, this past year, uh, in regard to uh, uh, Operation Desert Storm. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing that was unusual about this particular affair was that a great many people had joined the armed forces not realizing that they might have to fight someday. Mm -hmm. And Never when come that, home. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, they saw it as a place to get a good job mm -hmm. and an education. And uh, when they were actually faced with their own possible uh, destruction, it made them feel differently, uh, which of course is understandable. Uh, and this is called Calverton. Uh, a small bit of a background. Uh, there was a news report on January 31st of last year that due to a lack of available space at the national cemeteries in the New York City area, casualties of Operation Desert Storm will be interred at Calverton National Cemetery uh, here on Long Island. And this was written uh, in memory of Manuel Rivera, Jr., who was the first New York City casualty of Operation Desert Storm. And this is called Calverton. Lead me not in warrior's robes like those knights and knaves of yore, nor through the dim to distant fields where wretched battles rage and roar. For I've not malice in my soul, despise not faceless foe I seek, nor bloodlust want of victory for those ones daring but to speak. 
Cast not aside immortal youth as so much chaff upon the breeze, across the mead where devils dwell, against the ire of stormy seas. This duty as this night grows stark, naught but dread keeps me from reason. Sad circumstance, misfortune spark, sure no greater death than treason. So lead me not to take my stand, another hero in the sun, and lead me not to find my peace beneath the sod of Calverton. Mm, I like that nether hero in the sun. That's very good. Are there some subjects you wouldn't touch or some subjects you wouldn't think appropriate for poetry? I, I think you had one called uh, Safe Sex. I think you had another poem called Boobs. Did you? Boobs, yes. <laughs> now, maybe that some people would think that's not a subject for poetry. But well, I think any subject is open to poetry. I'm not saying that I would necessarily uh, okay. undertake it myself, but okay. uh, this was also related to Operation Desert Storm. I was homesick uh, last February mm -hmm. and was watching uh, some of the great television we see on uh, in the morning during the week. Uh, Sally Jesse Raphael uh, was having a show that. Uh, regarded women with very large breasts and the, the terrible lives that they lead because of it. And uh, during the course of this, there was a, a news break that the, uh, the Allied forces had mistakenly shelled a uh, Baghdad civilian uh, bomb shelter. And then when that was done, they went back to the uh, television program again. So I, I wrote this poem at the time called uh, Don't Call Them Boobs. This morning, as Sally Jesse Raphael was busy exposing the tragedy of women whose breasts are too large, the spectacle was interrupted by a news flash which said that the Air Force had misjudged and bombed a shelter full of Baghdad civilians. The general stepped up to say that he felt damn bad, and then Sally was back to say a word or two about how cruel men can be. Mm. Some of your poems have that little irony and a little twist. I know some of your poems rhyme, some don't rhyme. And I noticed that in, I know you personally, and I know you're a bit of a tease. <laughs> and you have that, that irony in your poem. But some of your poems, you have some poems that are openly humorous. Uh, there was one you wrote about uh, some feminist woman. Oh, yes, you, okay. That's a very recent <laughs> You want to read that? A new poem? This was, uh, yeah, this is also a new poem. This was based on uh, a true story. It didn't happen exactly as I portrayed in the uh, poem, but uh, of course, they call that poetic license, I suppose. Um, it's called Never Cross a Woman. There she came, as if from nowhere, Betty Friedan, the mother of all women, the feminine mystic, lobbying justice with an upraised fist, the high priestess of uterine actualization. There she came in a rusting old Plymouth, daring as she must to navigate the tight spots, careening off of the lady's new beamer, in the bright noontime bedlam of a Sag Harbor summer and stepped out to the confrontation. The lady said, save the speech, Betty. Who's going to pay for the goddamn crease in my door? When my husband sees this, he's going to kill me. <laughs> I like that one. Uh, you were talking before about Victoria being a muse. Uh, and in what way does a muse inspire? I mean, how, how does she inspire you? What is her? Well, I think just her appreciation of my writing has uh, made me want to do that uh, in the beginnings of our relationship. I found it was an easy way to please her to uh, sit down and write something, and I uh, would get great joy out of scribbling something down and then uh -huh. running into wherever she was in the apartment and telling her, mm -hmm. um, seeing what she thought about it. And uh, there's one here that uh, sort of speaks to that that's called Serendipity. Oh, I love to hear that. And, uh, it's, it's about me thinking about if I would have written so many poems uh, had I not met Victoria. I thought, my love, that had we not perchance to meet and entwine our passions, where might these verses have come to reside? Would they have known where to find me in my nameless elsewhere? Mm. And you have another beautiful poem, You to Me. Do you have that one? Yes, that one? yes. That's a love. As a matter of fact, that's, I like the love poem. So. You like that? That's okay. <laughs> I don't think there's enough romantic poetry That's being right. written anymore, mm -hmm. so I mm -hmm. enjoy writing it myself. Okay, this is the first poem in the book, and it's called You to Me. You to me are the chapel of all that's true, the golden, stroking, smooth step, an antidote to the sickness of miserable existence. A sip of jasmine tea in a steamy hot tub, a woolly red sweater on a chilly porch swing, an electric first kiss rush, a stapleless gatefold beauty, the quiet confidence of an old house cat, the sharpness of new broken crystal, 
a mountaintop collecting sun above the morning mist. You're the way home, the flint to the poet's fire, the sounds of crickets in the August hot night, a crackling log in a Christmas Eve snow, the soothing whisper of mother love, a goose down wrap on a winter bed, a head turner heart burner, silk stockings under blue jeans, the taste of sugar on a child's tongue, an extra big pie slice, the words to a sweet song, a cool wind kiss on a July high noon, moonlight through bare treetops, my forever dream in a jeweled box. Mm. That has such concrete imagery. I like that about your poetry. It's very accessible. The, the imagery is very, very real. Um, you also write about nature sometimes, don't you, and the environment? And, sure. And, and, and the, the conflict between man and, well, man and nature, or, or man's, the growth of man on the planet and nature. Uh -huh. And you showed me one poem. Um, was it Butterfly that I liked? Yes, right. okay. Sure. This that. was also written uh, very recently on a trip I took to uh, a friend of mine's uh, in Manhattan. I was sitting in his apartment mm -hmm. uh, one afternoon, happy to see a butterfly flying out in the street. What kind, now, what kind of butterfly was it? Was it was a monarch, monarch butterfly. butterfly. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I wrote this quickly called A Butterfly Visits Third Avenue. <laughs> Above Third Avenue, a butterfly is tossed about in the updraft of buses and yellow cabs over mortar mountains and asphalt valleys. Exhausted and disoriented, he alights and queries of a soft-faced passerby. Pardon me, friend, which way to Mexico? But the passerby only shrugged and said, never heard of it, it must be up in the Bronx. Mm. Interesting juxtaposition there between the, the natural habitat of the butterfly and then the concrete images of the city. Uh, you have a poem I love because it talks about the act of writing, what poetry is to you and, and what poetry may leave behind. I think it's called Feathers on Granite. Oh. If I could make another request. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, I like that poem. So, so I don't know how many poets usually comment on what poetry means to them and, and what writing means and, and how you hope perhaps that something you write is immortal and, and yes. lasts beyond you. Yeah, I think that know? most of us who write are doing it because we would like to think that our words will continue Extend after we're gone. Extend beyond our time. You know? And I realize that uh, the amount of influence that I can have on people is kind of small, but uh, nonetheless, um, if there is any influence or I can do something that may make somebody's life more pleasant or understandable by expressing my own opinions, I think it's worthwhile. Um, another friend on Shelter Island named Hollis Alpert said to me one time that it was not important uh, how large your audience is, but that you have one. And uh, so I, I took that uh, advice and wrote this called Feathers on Granite. In my deepest sleep, I dream I am standing sure and fast, rattling the great cage with the hands of a smithy. Where I walk, I leave fossils for forever, and my heart speaks with the command of thunder. But when I awake from this reverie, I can stand at my window and stare out over my shoebox kingdom, and I can smile the smile of a king, content to keep dropping these feathers on granite. Mm, I like the shoebox king. Uh you also have a, a number of new poems that you've been working on. I was wondering, did you want to read us something from your new work? Or uh, yeah, some we of haven't the ones that yet? I've read were, were new. Let and then I, I, you have to read Requiem for Naivete at some point if we okay. have time, because I love that sure. poem. Sure. This is sort of a sentimental one uh, called Grandmother. A nostalgia. Um, again, yeah. yeah. And uh, I think my grandparents generation was a generation where it was not easy for them to express their feelings or, or affections towards other people um, and it was really their upbringing um, and I thought uh, that I might address this and did send it to my grandmother and she said that uh, she saw you know had a great deal of realization after reading it grandmother I remember your red brick house with the 60 foot blue spruce once a sapling at the same time as my mother and a grand old oak in the yard, far too tall to be climbed. You always wore an apron, faux pearls, and sensible shoes. You cooked like a gardener or a painter of cherished scents. You gave us Cokes in eight ounce bottles, and always a pack of Wrigley's Spearmint sat next to the box of Philly's Blunts in that drawer by the stove. Okay. Roast with brown gravy, four flavors of briars, and the biggest lasagnas I'd ever seen. That red brick house smelled like Christmas, and Easter Sunday, and that birthday I'll never forget. You really had me believing that none of us would ever grow old, 
but I really should have known better. Every word you said was love to me. I remember that well, and how it was so hard for you to say it out loud, even when I was embracing you for dear life. Mm. If you were to describe yourself as a poet, how, how would you describe yourself? Uh, I don't know. I, f I think that uh, I used to struggle with the idea that I didn't have a particular identity or that I couldn't uh, align myself with a particular school of thought or style, but perhaps I've accepted that that is my style. I try to uh, sort of be uh, like a chameleon. I'll take the coloring of whatever the background is, and I find that uh, certain poems need to be written in it with a meter and, and a rhyme and other yeah. things need to be free verse and and uh, so i try to fit the particular style to whatever it is the point i'm trying to make and uh i find that that works and i've become comfortable with that so i don't know if i could really categorize myself uh, now i would say you were romantic realist you would think so okay <laughs> would you read us requiem for naivete sure, I, I find that in some ways a signature poem of yours and it says so much about what you believe. I think I have uh, a lot of like nice to response it. to this uh, poem and I do enjoy reading it. And people always uh, come up to you after you read yeah, it. Yeah, very frequently okay. people come up and ask strikes me about a chord. this. Uh, uh, if I can find it. Yes. <laughs> I know it's here somewhere. Maybe you should tell people where they could buy your book while you're looking for this. Um, it's available at most of the bookstores on the East End of Long Island, uh, here in, in Riverhead. That's and, this uh, uh, Dancing for Victoria, the poems um, of Dan Murray. Also at Catio's and Bookhampton. <laughs> and anyone who can find it, uh, it, it is listed uh, with an ISBN number, so it can be had Good. at almost any bookstore. And this is Requiem for Naivete. This is Requiem for Naivete. Um, this is basically about the loss of innocence, which I think is something that signals... Uh, maturity I guess you might say uh, as you get older and realize at some point that you're a grown-up mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure all of that is good but uh, this is requiem for naivete when I was young I used to believe the world was safe that wars were only glorious tales in history books and that all endings were happy ones I used to believe when I was young that dreams came true and nightmares vanished when you opened your eyes that parents and teachers and people with power were smarter than I and that age brought wisdom, not blindness. When I was young, things were different. I used to believe innocence brought serenity, that guilt was the essence of purity, that death was a concept from which I was excused, and that recognition came from raising my hand. When I was young, I thought love conquered all, that there was a shoulder offered for every tear, and that no one could say that they loved me and then leave me to die. My world was somewhere else back then. I used to think there was great wealth in copper, that white picket fences need not be electrified, that time could not end before my time was done, and that God was not just born of the desperation of mortality. I used to imagine in my youth that the world ended at the railroad tracks, and that all the insane were locked safely away, that good intentions gave rise to truth, and that tomorrow would come no matter what. When I was young, I thought youth had no value, and that age brought freedom that suffering was just for saints and sinners, that the fires of hell never lapped up on the shore, and that conscience was what made us human. In those days long ago, I was sure that thunder came from the bowling of angels, that the sky was blue because it was Adam's favorite color, and that there were no real endings just to be continued, and if today was bad, tomorrow would be better. When I was young, they told me that lies were evil unless you had reasons, and lust was a great geyser that needed capping, that you could flash guns and knives, but not genitalia. That censors were only looking out for our good. That judges were just and snakes never walked upright. And so too I believed them when they said to my young face that animals were happy in cages, that a rope around the neck was better than being killed by a car. And they said, ask and it shall be given, and no one could take what was truly mine. That God loves men who build cathedrals among starving children and that blood is thicker than water until it runs from your veins. When I was young, I was lied to in many tongues. They told me rainbows always follow rain, and that no one was sad on Christmas Day, that scars will always fade with time, and that the road to beyond is the one most traveled. Mm, that's beautiful. And it brings together so many of your thoughts and images about life and the importance of, I guess, doing something now. I mean, if I were to... And, and, and realizing that even though you've lost something, that you can gain something through knowledge? In, in oh, that. sure. Yeah, I think uh -huh. that uh, 
you have to, uh, part of growing up is changing your perspectives on things. It doesn't mean that you disregard or, or discard things from the past, but you have to sort of requalify them and make them work in the present. Yeah, you bring in, in your poems, you bring in so much nostalgia, and it, there's a very American quality to your poetry that maybe it's from your influence with the beats, I don't know, but there's this sense of this is all a new land, and even though there's disappointment, you can make everything new. I get that from your poetry. That's why I see the optimism in your, in your poetry all the time. Yeah, I mean, I try to be optimistic. Uh, the poems uh, some people have read and, and decided were full of tragedy or sadness, and I, I don't yeah, see it that way, because yeah. if, if you have those sort of things and you're able to overcome them or, or uh, even to reflect upon them and... Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a negative thing. It can be a positive mm -hmm. thing as well. And I think that understanding your childhood or the past is an important part of being able to move forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, I should, again, tell the audience the title of your book is Dancing for Victoria, and they can get it again. Where do... Um, most of the bookstores in the East End the East have End it. Uh, you should be able to find it. And where do you usually read if people want to hear you read? Um, more often than not, I read at Canios, but I've also read at the Old Stump Gallery the Old Stump and uh, the Shelter Island Library and uh, in well, West Hampton. And, uh, so I guess if they look in the a Newsday or something like that, they could yeah, find out the calendar. Yeah, Newsday or Dance Papers or uh, even Suffolk Life or one of those newspapers. Well, I'm sure the audience will be looking listings. forward to hearing. Um, do you have a very, very, very short poem we could close on? Maybe sure. <laughs> very yes. tiny poem? Let me see. we have time for it. Okay. This was a very short one that was about uh, several things that went on a few weeks ago and I just called 1191 because it was written in November 1991. A month in which a peacemaker was unchanged from a tomb in the cellar of hell. The voice of hate removed its mask to a sea of whispers and the next to last hero was sentenced to die for all of our sins. That's a reflection on uh, Terry Waite being released yes. and David well, Duke running for president and uh, Magic Johnson. What an interesting uh, juxtaposition of people. Mm. Well, they were all people who were very uh, present in the news yes. that week and were having an enormous but That's an effect. interesting concretization of the revolution, uh, the release, uh, and then the idea of uh, the scourge of AIDS, mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. coming together in, in imagery. Mm. They're all tied together in certain respects. Um, I want to thank you, Dan Moran, for your beautiful poetry, your insightful poetry, which deals with, I think our audience understands, the cauldron of experience and nostalgia and, and just dealing with the realities of life on this planet, right? And I thank you again. I am Virginia Walker, and I thank you for watching Ideas and Images. Uh, and I want to thank Mary Ann Martins, Mary Star Productions, for making this and other productions possible on the arts and for Jackie Moss and others who have made uh, this production uh, possible. Uh, perhaps we can uh, talk a little bit more in the moment we have, or I guess we don't, we don't have a moment. So again, Dan, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Right. I enjoyed it.